All right, so let's see. Um, this is uh, this is a talk about um, about the Unix uh, process model and how processes work. Now, process is kind of the basic unit of work in Unix. Um, the the two, two big pieces of the Unix system are there's this file system that stores data, and that's interesting all by itself. And actually, I had given a talk about that in the previous year, uh, which I thought about proposing, and then no, it needed too much revision. Uh, and also, uh, anyway, you don't care, I'm sorry. Um, and then there's processes, and processes are like, so the file system is like the nouns, and the processes are like verbs. They're actually like running programs that are doing something. Uh, and so I'm going to use a bunch of examples of uh, uh, interesting programs that at least some people will be, everyone should be familiar with a couple of these. The shell is the program that like reads your commands. Uh, LS uh, is kind of a little used, but maybe some of you are familiar with it. That's a joke. <laughs> Um, less, uh, I don't know, I was reading this slide, this is pointless. Okay, what the heck just happened here? There we go. Right. Uh, so yeah, you're only going to know two things about Unix internals. Uh, they should be the inode, which is the fundamental kernel data structure that represents a file. Uh, and uh, if you're interested, tag me afterwards and we can talk about it. And the process. So inodes represent files, and this is the talk about processes. Um, when you run a program, the program itself is just a file on the disk. It's just data, and it sits there, right? It's, it's just data. It's not on the disk, it sits there. But when you run the program, uh, Unix creates an object called a process. And the most important thing in the process is the code for the program, the actual instructions that have to be run. But there's a, a large amount of other equipment um, that has to be attached to this to make it work. Uh, and so there's, a, there's this important distinction between a program and a process. You've only got one program for cat. Everybody knows cat? You've only got one program. It's in slash bin slash cat. That's the program. But you could have 73 different cat processes all running at the same time, each one with the same code in it, but each one is a separate process. Right. Here, we're going to run this complicated shell command, which creates three processes, each of which is running cat. The distinction split? It's good. All right. Um, so there's the, the object code, it's called. Also, unfortunately, called the text. Um, for uh, This is the actual instructions. And if you ever looked at like one of these files, like you, you actually like open your editor on bin cat and you look at it, it doesn't look anything like text, like a bunch of gibberish. So I don't know why they call it that, but it's been called that for 40 years. Uh, 50 years, maybe 50 years. Uh, but then what else is there? Well, there's, each process has a unique ID number called a, a PID or PID. Uh, and you can use that to identify the process. And let's see what else. Each process has its own idea of the current working directory, right? You know how in the shell, you can ask it to print your working directory with the PWD command, where am I? Each process has one of those. And what you're asking the shell is, what's the, what's the current working directory of this shell process? So it's per process. Uh, and it has a user ID that says, who's, that says who owns the process and whose permissions is it allowed to run with. So if the process tries to open a file and it needs to check file permissions, and it says, oh, this can only be read by the owner of the file, which is Dominus, ID number 119. Uh, well, the process has an ID in it, and if that process ID, uh, the process's owner ID is not 119, it's not allowed to open the file. And then there's a group ID. Actually, for kind of strange reasons, there's actually multiple UIDs and multiple group IDs. But we're going to, I think I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, the important one is the one that, that controls permissions. Um, as a, a table of all the files that the process has open, this is per process, uh, called the open file table. What else? It has an environment. That's where the environment variables are stored. Again, this is per process. The environment is actually really simple. It's just a big pile of, uh, it's a block of memory, typically with string data in it. Uh, it's actually that simple. And, um, but it's not a hash. It is just a big block of data with uh, a bunch of strings in it and terminated by zeros, I think. Uh, strings usually, but not invariably, of the form x equals sign y. Uh, where x is the variable name and y is the intended value. Uh, 
Uh, and one of the first things the C library will do, if you ask it to get environment variables, it will parse this thing and try to build it possibly a flash table. Modify it, it has to rewrite the whole thing at some point. Uh, it's really funny. It's uh, it's you know, it's, uh, it's the, the algorithm is terrible. But um, one of the uh, one of the reasons for Unix's great success is that the Bell Labs people who built it uh, were really really smart, and they knew all the really really good algorithms, and they knew when not to use them. Uh, and they never used a binary search or a linear search would do. And as a result, this code was really robust, and it worked. Uh, and this is an example of that. And the environment's not that big, so you don't need a fancy algorithm, right? You know, it's maybe a couple of kilobytes. Uh, it has a single, oh, I'm just going to go ahead. I'm going to talk about all this stuff. I don't want to get All right, so we have one of the major duties of the Unix kernel is to manage the processes. Uh, and it has these two that, anybody know about the Unix kernel's API? So these are called system calls. They're requests you make to the kernel to have it do stuff for you, like create a file, or destroy a file, or create a process. So that the two main functions in Unix for, uh, for managing processes are fork, which creates a new process, and exec, which tells it what program to run. Exec you use on an existing process. When that process does exec, so I want to exec bin cat. It's, it's of this somewhere. Sorry. All right. Well, okay. So hold on a minute. I gotta swap something. So this is like a monster movie. Fork, your process, and you call fork, that means you want to make an exact clone of yourself. And now there's two of you. Okay. But exec is a little weirder. Exec means there's a brain on the table. And you want to scoop your own brain out and throw it away and install this brain instead. And so, <coughs> All right, we're going to explore that a little more. Uh, well, uh oh, this thing. All right. So, so let's let's look at an actual example of the scooping out process. Um, so we're at the shell. We're we're typing at the shell here, and uh, we type ps because we want to run the ps command, whatever that does. I don't know why they use ls here. Sorry. Uh, and. So there is a process already running a shell. It's running slash bin slash sh. And that program is running and it's reading from the terminal. You type ps, you hit enter. What happens? Well, the shell needs to go and run the ps program. And to run the ps program, it needs to create a new process in which ps can run. So the first thing it does is it calls fork and creates an exact clone of itself. And so here's the original process is called the parent, and the new process is called the child. And from that moment, they're both running identical code. And then the child goes and execs PS. It scoops out its brain, which is saying how to be the shell. And it gets the PS brain, and now it's PS. Uh, and then since it's now PS, it goes and does what PS does. Uh, and then eventually it exits. The parent shell, meanwhile, is waiting around for the child process to finish. And when it does finish, it prints another shell prompt and asks for the next command. Uh, if it didn't wait, it would print the prompt immediately, and then that would get mixed up in the output from PS, which you usually don't want. And if you stick an ampersand on the end of the command, all that does is it tells the shell, go ahead without waiting for the child to exit. That's exactly what ampersand means. Okay. So this is like the fundamental thing. And if you're only going to remember one thing from this talk, it should be this. Any questions, any questions before we go on? Nobody has any questions? Come on. I'm sorry, again, slowly? Yes, I have an exec bit PS, right? 
Shouldn't that be like an exact sign process ID or something? Nope. The child is a process and it has a process ID. And the only thing, you can't exec something in another process. You can only scoop out your own brain. So the child process scoops out its own brain and puts in PS. I'm not allowed to scoop out your brain, only you can do that. <laughs> Serious consent issue here, right? Yeah. You can go around look, replacing people's brains. That's that's not fair. Yeah, Nikki. Is this the only way to start a process? This is the only way to start a process, with one exception. This is the only way to start. Yes, this is the only way to start a process. But actually, <laughs> the exception is the init process. That's right. The kernel itself at boot time starts the first process, which is called init, and always has a process ID of one. Everything else, every other process is created with fourth call. Yes? Uh, so the CWD is not usually, it doesn't have to be where the code is designed, right? No, and in fact, it usually isn't. The current working directory is not usually where the code is. You give the full path to the place where the code is, and you can exec it from anywhere. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to run PS without first doing CD slash bin, and that would be simple, <coughs> right? Um, okay, any other questions? These are really good questions. All right, well, I will continue. So here is the, an implementation of the world's smallest shell program, also the world's worst shell. But I wanted to show you what it looks like. Unfortunately, it's in Perl, and we're still losing the bottom off of this. This is really unfortunate. Okay, I'm going to fix this. Yeah, I We're going to pause for a technical break here. All right. Uh, how are, are we better now, Pam? All right. Anybody else want to chime in? No? All right. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so this is Perl, but I, I, um, and I know a lot of you folks aren't that familiar with Perl. But um, the code is so short that I don't think it's going to be too troublesome. And it calls a really nice language for this kind of thing, uh, since it was invented and designed for it. All right. So what's going on here? Let's see. Uh, this thing turns off buffering so that when you print the prompt, it appears on the terminal immediately, even though you didn't print a new line. This is an infinite loop. The infinite loop prints a prompt, and then it reads a command from the standard input, which is usually attached to the terminal. And if the command is empty, that's how you tell the shell you're done, and last exits the loop, and that's the end of the program. Uh, otherwise, it trims the new line off the end of the command, and then it parses your command and splits it on white space into the first word, which is the name of the program you're trying to run, and the following words, if any, which are the arguments you want to give to the program. Good so far? And then, imagine, it forks. So it clones itself. There's an exact clone. Uh, now, as I'm sure you're aware, when you go into the cloning shop and you ask them to make an exact clone of you, it's very important you ask them for the special marker. Right? For those of you who may have temporarily forgotten, I'm going to explain. Right? They put you in the duplicating machine, and it duplicates every cell in your body exactly and even the clothes you're wearing, but there's a special marker that the duplicator can't see that they use for like putting directions or something on your body. And you have to borrow that marker and write on your arm, you are not the clone. And then they put you in the duplicator, and the clone comes out exactly the same, and you're the clone now, right? You wait, and the first thing you do is, of course, you look at your arm. And if it says you are not the clone, you know you're the original. And if it doesn't say that, that meant that you are the clone because the marker didn't get duplicated. And so you know you have to like go out and work telemarketing or something, because that's what you're for. Right? And otherwise, you would get in an argument about who it was was the original and gets to sit and drink martinis while the other one works as a telemarketer. So, right? Everybody's familiar with this. Good. Okay. So this same thing is happening here. Fork creates an identical process. Two processes. And what's the next thing this process is going to do? Well, a fork is going to return, but since it's creating a clone, you call it once, but it returns twice. It returns once in the parent and once in the child. And how do you know if you're the clone or not? The answer is that if you're in the parent, 
fork returns the process ID of the new child process. But if you're in the child, it returns zero. So you capture that. Okay. Uh, oh, and it might fail completely, in which case you get back an undefined value. So this is checking for that error condition. And then we just say, okay, well, I couldn't fork. I couldn't run your command because I couldn't fork. But the normal thing is, then the first thing you do is you look at your arm. This is your arm. And you say, okay, well, if the process CD is zero, I'm the child, and I'm going to scoop out my brain and go run this program and go off and be a telemarketer. And if it's not zero, then you're the parent process and you call wait, which means stop and do nothing until the child exits. Is that good? <coughs> so, so you get back a different value depending on whether you're the parent or the child. The parent waits, the child calls exec. At that point, it's okay, it's my job to run the command while the parent waits. And it runs exec, calls it with the program, the arguments. That means the child stops running this code. It destroys this code completely, puts it in the trash, and instead it becomes PS, or whatever your command was. Now, fork, you call it once and it returns twice, unless there's an error. Exec, you call it once and it doesn't return at all. Because you can't say, okay, well, after I scoop out my brain and replace it with Nikki's brain, after that I'm going to go out for a beer. You don't get to decide. Nikki gets to decide if she's going to go out for a beer. <laughs> so you don't get to say what happens after exec. You call it once, it doesn't return. Uh, unless there's a failure, in which case you say, oh, sorry, my brain transplant failed. I couldn't run your program because I couldn't replace my brain. Yes, in the back. This one doesn't respect the ampersand. Oh, no, no, totally doesn't. I told you, it's the world's worst shell. It doesn't have ampersand, doesn't have pipes, doesn't have file redirection, doesn't have programming features. All it does is you type a command at it and it runs the command. I, I, I'd say it's the world's worst shell, right? And it is. It's the smallest thing that you can legitimately call a shell. And I think we are about to have a demo. If I remember where I put this code. larger for the video. What's that? A little larger would be great for the video. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. sure. Is that better? Yes. Good. Bigger still? Is it good? No, it's good. All right. Okay, there it is printing the prompt. What command shall we run? Yes. Yes. Here's, we'll try with, a, with an argument. Uh, let's try one where the exact fails. I think I have a snopopotamus. This could sound like that Debian wants me to install the snopopotamus package, and I'm going to totally wait. <laughs> ah! Good. I need you to give us the right error message. No such file or directory. Uh, so let's see. Uh, 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 it's harder to simulate a fork failure. Um, typically, that happens because the process table is full because you're running too many processes, or because all your memory is used up and it can't get memory to create a new process. Uh, if I were to simulate either of those, that would be the end of the talk. So, <laughs> uh, any, any requests before we move on from this? So you have a die statement. I'm sorry? You have a die statement at the die end. Die statement. Yes. And it's interesting, sorry. that shows that you forked, because that would kill the program if uh, it was running like, you can tell that only the child is running that die statement because the child can't. No, I know that. Oh, okay, so the exec, you call it, and it doesn't return, right? Okay. Except if it couldn't exec at all, like when I ran Snogopotamus. And in that case, it does return failure. It never returns successfully. And then we go on to the next line, and the child process commits suicide. And the parent process, which was waiting for it, says, okay, now I will continue. Got it? And that's just what we saw. Is somewhere. What will happen if you press exit? If I type exit? Ah, that's a good question. That's a great question. Let's find out what happens when I type exit. Are you ready? <laughs> and I'm about to explain that. We'll get to it, okay? Um, so this one, you may recall, you enter a blank line to get it to exit. Uh, 
Uh, whoops, that didn't work. Oh, that's right, this program has a bug. <laughs> uh, because remember I had to chomp off the new line? I did the test before the chomp. So it's checking to see if my new line, the string consisting of only a new line is empty. Uh, and so uh, we can still fix this, actually. I'm going to type Control D, which is going to mean send the input to the, uh, to the program without typing a new line. Ah, uh, there it worked. OK. Um, let's fix that. No, that's not, it's not relevant. All right. Any other questions about this? Please, Chris. What happens if you type CD? What if I type CD? All right, let's do it. What if I type CD? All right, and we'll see why that is shortly. I'm planning to discuss that. Nikki, what if you ran the shell from the inside instance of the shell? Oh, yeah, what if I ran the shell from this? Oh, hold on, let's try curl shell. <laughs> 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 now we're back in the outer shell, which was waiting for the child shell to complete, right? And then I'm going to exit again. And so just what you thought. Okay, further questions? I'm glad we're talking about this, because this is all really instructive, I think. It's good? I'm having fun. I hope you're having fun, too. All right, back to this thing. Uh, that was the world's worst shell, which we now have demonstrated. Now it's got all small again. All right, why are fork and exec separated? Why is it that you fork separately from exec? Why not just have a function that you call and say, please fork and run this program? And um, just spoil the ending here. Uh, Windows does do it that way. And that's how you know it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is like this is maybe the single most brilliant design decision in all of the brilliant designs of Unix. The answer is that because the parent code still has control after the fork in the new process, it can change the environment of that process before it runs the child. So for example, why is it useful? Redirection is the number one. Why is it that you can redirect? And the answer is, so we're re redirecting PS's output to a file here. How does that work? Let's see. The shell says, OK, each process has what's called an open file table. The open file table is uh, maps, uh, it's just an array, actually. And it maps numbers. Originally, there were 20 slots. These days, it's more likely to be 1,024. Um, to these pointers that point into the kernel's open file structure that says what file is being read to or read from or written to. And so entry number one in that table, not zero, but one, is what is my standard output? It's conventionally, it doesn't have to be, but it's, that's what standard output means, is please operate on entry number one from the current process's open file table. And normally, that's attached to some kind of terminal device, because it's printing to the terminal. Uh, so here's the name of the terminal device, dev tty p3. tty is the teletypewriter I mentioned this yesterday. p3 is usually they were like, uh, Started with like P, P0, P1, P2, and then Q, and then R, and S, and then after that, that was not. Um, so, so you have the shell, and its standard output, open file number one, is pointing at the terminal. And then it wants to run a command, and it wants to redirect PS's output to some file. The first thing it does is fork, and the open file table is copy. So the child shell also has its standard output pointing at the same terminal. And then, if it were to do exec right away, the open file table doesn't change. PS runs, and it doesn't care where it's outputting to. All it knows is I print the standard output. Whatever thing is in slot number one of that table, that's where I'm printing. It doesn't even have to know what it is. It just tells the kernel, uh, yeah, print to number one. Uh, literally, the call is it's in, in the Unix API, it's, it's called write, is the function, W-R-I-T-E. And the first argument is a number, in this case, one. Always one. If you were writing with standard error, it's two. If you were writing with something else, it might be some other number. If you write to zero, that's weird because that's a standard input. But it can be done. And there is actually a program that does that, I think. <laughs> I don't know why. Anyway, all right. So 
So PS goes, PS is always going to do the same thing. It's always going to write to file descriptor number one, entry number one in the table. And since the shell port and number one is still pointing at the terminal, it prints to the terminal. But for a redirection, the shell does something amazing. It does the fork just like before. And then this child process, oh, oh, wait, we need to redirect. And it goes and it closes file descriptor one, file table entry number one. And then it tries to reopen the file that you said, it tries to open the file that you said to redirect to with file descriptor one. And so it opens that file, let's say slash temp slash prox. And it attaches that to file descriptor one. So now you have a parent which has its output still going to the terminal, but the child process's standard output is pointing into the file. And then it execs PS just like before. So it was this, now it turns into that. And PS does exactly the same thing in exactly the same way. It says, ah, I'm printing the standard output. I'll pass that one to the right call and tell it I want to print to file number one. And the kernel says, oh, file number one is attached to this file here. And instead of calling the terminal driver to output the characters to the terminal, I'll call the file system driver to write them into the file. And PS doesn't have to know a thing. One second, I am ranking here. Um, the shell does everything, and PS doesn't have to care. You want PS running over a network socket? PS doesn't have to have networking in it. You only have to arrange that some process creates a network socket, attaches it to file descriptor one, and execs PS. You want it to go to a file, you just have to arrange that your program opens the file, attaches it to descriptor one, and calls PS. So every program under Unix supports redirection to any destination without any additional code. It's all this like little bit of stuff in the shell. OK, I'm done ranting. So for one brief moment, um, there's no, no place output goes. Yep. What happens if opening the new file errors out? What happens if opening the new file? Right. So, so we, closed, uh, we closed a standard output, right? And then we tried to open the file, but the open failed, commission reasons or whatever. Maybe the disk is full, maybe it's on fire. Um, then what? Well, the child needs to print an error message and then commit suicide. The child, fortunately, can print its error message to the terminal because the error stream is attached to the scripter 2. What happens if there's an error opening? That's a terrific question. When you're going to redirect standard error, uh, you play a trick. You will duplicate the file descriptor. Say, OK, I want to open file descriptor 2 and attach it to whatever empty descriptor I have, say 13. Then it closes 2. And then it, uh, then it tries to reopen it to a file or whatever. And if that fails, it can still print the error on descriptor 13. Got it? And this is actually a common technique. And it's not even that tricky, right? It's a couple extra lines of code. So it was a good question. Thank you. Uh, not something I thought I mentioned. Anybody else have any other questions, good or bad? No. Everybody is content? You're not all like getting up and dancing in the aisles over the brilliance of the Unix redirection <laughs> process. I feel like I didn't get something across. Yeah, yeah, you're going to dance. So, so is it impossible to do this on Windows? It's impossible. So, so here's the thing about Windows, OK? They have this fork and exec call. I don't remember what it's called. It's Vaughn or something. Um, and then, so but what if you want to do a, 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 a redirection, right? And even the Windows people were not so foolish that they decided you have to support redirection in every single command, although they did do that for file plotting. I'm, I'm sorry. So um, instead, there is an option you can include in the spawn call that says, please redirect this descriptor to there, that descriptor to there, and so on. Um, but now we're going to have like three more slides around like, here's another thing that the shell can do between the fork and the exec. Here's another thing the shell can do between the fork and the exec. Here's an, every, in Windows, every single one of those is a different option to the spawn function. And the manual for the spawn function is like 75 pages long. Because every time they needed, to, they thought of something else you need to do, it had to go into this one function. Brilliance of the Unix people is that they are able to divide functionality in a way that it composes. That there's these 
small functions, right? Do small things, and the way you can put them together to build complex things. The small pieces don't have to be complex, and that's all through Unix. All right, question. Is there like a security aspect to this as well, where one is, is better than the other? Uh, is there a security <coughs> aspect? Huh? Uh, are you thinking of something in particular? Uh, like, I guess if Windows uh, has, um, like, like, it seems to me that the Unix uh, method of, uh, you can only scoop out your own brain, mm -hmm. it seems inherently like more secure than being able to scoop out, giving like control of scooping out brains to like other processes, you know? I don't think it does that, right? You can, um, right, because when you do this spawn call, you're only saying, okay, I want to clone myself, and then the child should scoop out its brain. Um, so you're still not scooping out anyone else's brain. Okay. Uh, as far as I know, it's possible that there is a different unrelated call in Windows. It does say, please operate on brain surgery on someone else. Uh, you know, nothing would surprise me. I could come up with a theoretical one that might make this version more secure. Let's say there's a system call that lets you say, I don't want to be able to access the network for the rest of my lifetime uh -huh. as a process. Okay. With the fork exec model, you could make that call as part of the parent side code. Um, like you could fork and then make that call then exec. Uh -huh. And with the windows, you'd be dependent on whether they decided to add this feature to spawn, right? Uh, yeah, I guess, but although, I mean, in the Unix case, you still have to have the kernel supporting the, uh, the ability to turn off the network. Uh, so, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't see the security issue, but I may be missing something. That said, I have a suspicion that if you were to look into the Windows thing carefully, you would find a long history of security catastrophes, uh, just because it's Windows. Uh, and they have that long history, but Unix hasn't also been entirely free of security catastrophes itself, so I want to overemphasize that. All right, any further questions? You did? All right, I'm not did something cool. It's not really cool, it's check this out. Nobody else can see that. That's true. So can you show me afterwards? Yeah. It's so cool that we got to stop and like everybody has to see it. No. That's a serious question. I'm not like yeah. okay. All right. So you show me later, and then like we'll like post about it. You're curious though. Huh? <laughs> can you briefly summarize what it is? Oh, I just show you. I can split my terminal into two sections. I got the tech to ty and got the back to that thing at one. Uh huh. Into another one, just echo to that to ty. Oh, we can totally do that. Yeah, this is definitely a better way. We're going to split into two sessions here. Well, actually, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. This is even easier. I'm going to type TTY here, and it's going to say, oh, you're using dev PTF. This damn thing. Why is it doing that? Oh, I know why it's this. All right. TTY dev PTS 10. And then we're going to go over to this tab here, very similar. And I'm going to run TTY. And it's going to say, oh, no, you're using terminal 14. And then I'm going to go over to here. Oh, wait, that's a different computer. That's not good. We're going to go over to here, and we're going to run the same TTY command as we tell you 13. So, oh, yeah, I, I know. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, 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 right, right, right. Okay, I know what you're going to do. All right. So we'll say echo, I like my flow into dev PTS. Was it 10? Yeah. 10. And then when we go back over here, we see that somebody has blasted I like Pi onto our terminal. Uh, thank you. That is actually really cool. And I'm glad we stopped for it. Uh, yes. And their, um, the uh, earliest Unix chat program worked precisely this way. Uh, I ran as super user, so I had permission to write to everybody's terminals. You tell it who you wanted, would figure out what terminal they were using, and then it would take your text and blat it to their terminal uh, with a little prefix so they would know like, what was going on. Uh, and then there was an option to like, you could run it. Uh, the rece recipient could run it and say, okay, and it would figure out who you were trying to reply to and blat them onto their terminal, uh, which I do not remember the name of the program, unfortunately. It was terrible, but it was really simple, and it worked. Um, I think in ancient times, of course, these different terminals were actually plugged into different ports in the back of the, of the computer, and like there was like separate hardware for a separate terminal. Um, you know, one of those clattering teletypewriter devices or something, uh, or a modem maybe. Um, now, of course, there are these 
entirely virtual things that know how to talk the expert upon on the back. Yeah. So just to clarify, the devices in DevTTY, that, uh, those are descriptors for the standard input of those TTYs? No, a, T a device is, has a different interface. It doesn't have a standard input or a standard output. Only a process has a standard input or a standard output. Uh, a device in Unix, um, this, we're getting a little far afield, but I think that's okay for a bit. Um, let's do ls minus l on this Dev PTS thing. Is this big enough, Chris? Should I make it bigger? That's fine. All right. All right. So here's. Well, let's also look at like thin cat. These are going to be quite different. You may not have ever seen this thing before. So here's bin cat. When I do ls on it, it tells me the size of the file. Uh, and as I guess you probably know, this hyphen on the beginning means it's a plain file, not a directory, not a soft link, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Uh, device is a special kind of file that you don't usually find places. It's a C here, that means it's a character device, uh, which is kind of the default. And it's owned by me because it's my terminal, and nobody but me is allowed to write to it without permission. Uh, and I'm allowed to read and write. Because somebody else had permission and they could read from my terminal device, they could grab the characters in my output and see stuff that they're not supposed to see. Uh, and then instead of a size, it doesn't have a size. Instead, it has this 13610 thing. Um, the 136 describes what kind of device it is. In this case, a terminal device. And it's actually indexed into a table inside the kernel that points to all the different device driver code. So entry number 136 in that table is the pointer to the device driver routines that know how to operate terminals. And then the 10 here is a parameter that gets passed to that device driver code that tells it which device it needs to actually deal with. You need to deal with Dev PTS 73? No, it says 10. You need to deal with Dev PTS 10. Uh, and so, so that's what the device is. It doesn't have a standard input or a standard output. Instead, when you when a process is standard output, it's attached to this device, and it issues a write call. The kernel says, oh, okay, you're writing to descriptor one. That's attached to this terminal device. And I see that that file is a character device of type 136, so it takes that data and it runs the device driver code. It says, you have just received this data on instance number 10. And then the device driver code knows what to do with that to make the terminal operate properly. Does that make sense? Yeah, so what, what actually happens there if you were to try to just um, write to a device directly depends on what type of device it is. Totally, yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, Oh, yeah, so here's a, here's a terrific example. Here is a totally different device called Dev Null. Okay? It's still a character device. It's writable and readable by everybody. And instead of a 136, which means it's a terminal device, it has a 1, which means it's a null device. Uh, instance number 3 for some reason. So here's what happens when I write to Dev Null. This data gets is a write call. Can this is a write call? So I want to write to the. I know it's open the file. It has a descriptor like seven or something. So I want to write to descriptor seven. The kernel says, "Oh, that's attached to this uh, this device here." And then it goes and finds pointer to the device driver routines in slot number one of the device driver table. It says, "All right, device driver, you just received this data on instance number three. Do what you will." And the device driver, since it's the device driver for dev null, says, "Okay, done." Please go ahead, and it puts it nowhere. <laughs> so if it were a modem device, it would do like some hardware thing where it actually sends the data on the modem, but it's the null device, so it returns successfully without writing anything else. Um, so if you read from the, the null device, which we now do, okay, it's going to go. The kernel's going to say, I'd like to read uh, 1,024 bytes from you, the device driver. And the device driver says, uh, sorry, there's no data there. Kernel treats it just as if it had got no data from the book. No, nothing. You should do a little bit of a, one last demo, all right? I think this is fun. Uh,
you know, we're hacking here. Are we like, yeah, 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 are we in the right place? Or can we go with this? Can we go with this? Let's see if I can get this. Yes. Okay, see how slowly those characters are coming out? I'm going to type, I like pie. What happened there? There are two processes, both trying to read from the same device. We've got the shell in this window, and we've also got cat over in this window. There's your I like pie, and they're competing, and which one of them gets the next character depends on who happens to have the time slice at the moment. <laughs> so. This cat gets half the characters, and the shell gets the other half of the characters, and that's why you don't usually want to do this. <laughs> Actually, cat looks like it's a little bit better at grabbing the characters than the shell. Might be a little faster. The yeah. shell's more a lot more complicated. Oh, wait, I gotta go kill this over here. All right. So, so that's that's uh, that's some of my favorite tacky for the moment. We're running way over time. Uh, all right. So I'm not going to ask for any more questions. You can take me out. Uh, let's see. All right. Vice Rider Excursion. Right? That's never happened to me. Uh, okay. okay, who knows what I get to use? Oh, wait, wait, wait. You have to talk about pipes. Pipes. Pipes, 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 pipes. Pipes. I like, totally remember being like 19 years old and discovering pipes for the first time. I just couldn't believe how awesome they were. <laughs> like, I think like Julia Evans about S Trace, I was totally like that about the pipes. <laughs> um, all right, so for pipe, you want to take the output of PS and feed it into the input of Gren. The shell forks twice, once for PS and once for Gren. In between the fork, it creates this pipe object, and it attaches the input end of the pipe to standard, uh, to Gren's descriptor zero, and attaches the output end of the pipe to PS's standard output. And then when PS writes to standard output, the kernel says, oh, okay, standard output's attached to this pipe object. It stores the data in the pipe until the pipe fills up. Uh, and when grep goes to read, the kernel says, oh, okay, that descriptor's a reading the descriptor attached to this pipe. It reads the data out of the pipe, and grep gets the data from the pipe and has no idea that it's not reading a file. Uh, as far as it's concerned, it's reading a file, whatever, I don't care. Network, file, device, same thing. Uh, and it just works. And so the shell has to do a bunch of jiggery pokery here. Uh, I think I have a version of this little tiny shell that actually sets this up later. I don't know. Uh, so who knows what INET is? Anybody? We're going to skip INET. All right, so here is a slightly less cruddy shell. What does this do? It has minimal redirections in it. It's basically the same shell as before. We get the same infinite loop, the same prompt, read the command, the same bug, chop the command, parse the, the parser's gotten a little more complicated. Before we were splitting on white space just to break it into words, now we've got to recognize redirections. Uh, so we'll see that in a minute. But it returns back this hash, this dictionary structure, which has, uh, here's the command, here's the arguments, and also entries for the redirections that need to be done, if there are any. Uh, and then, um, it forks. If the fork fails, it prints a message. Uh, if you're the parent process, you wait around for the child, just like before. If you're the child process, you're going to exec, you're going to scoop out your brain and run the command, but first, you're going to redirect the output and the input. Good? So let's see. If that uh, command structure says there's a standard in redirection, then uh, in Perl, this says close the standard in and reopen it from whatever this file name is. So it's that simple as Perl. And C would be like two lines instead of one. There'd be close, then there'd be an open, then there'd be, oh, there is an error handling. If you can't open it, then the child should commit suicide. Hey, I can't redirect from a non-existent file, or you don't have permission to read that file, or the disk is on fire. Uh, and then it does the same thing for standard out. It closes the standard output, reopens it. Um, this thing is a, is a little trick that I'll explain in a moment. Uh, having redirected standard in to standard out, it calls exec. If successful, that's the end. It doesn't get to decide what happens next, but if it fails, then it prints an error message and commits suicide. Any questions before I uh, get to the fine points? It's all perfectly clear? Partly clear? That's good. Andrew? All right. Libby? Are you approved? Libby approves this message. 
Um, there are two ways to redirect standard out. You can use one arrow or two arrows. Who knows about this? I only know the one arrow. You only know the one arrow? I've only ever seen the one arrow. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, all right, let's fix this. Sorry. Uh, 
Uh, and then we do a little, a little bit of bit hackery. And uh, if it turns out you look at these two bits, and if those two are a zero and a one, then it's a device, a character device file. Uh, and then you look at element six, which if it's a device file, that's the magic, that's the, like, what kind of device it is, the 136. Uh, oh, except, I'm sorry, it's only the low byte of that number. It's a C, you know? So we're implementing C here, but we're using crawl. Uh, and I thought it was device number five, but apparently that's changed. Uh, and it says, oh, yep, it's a terminal. Otherwise it says, no, it's not a character device of type five. It's not a terminal. Um, you probably wouldn't write this, because it's not portable, as you now know. Because on the old system, in 2003, it was 5, and now it's 136. And it could totally vary from system to system. So you're more likely going to use this POSIX function called is a TTY, which, under the hood, is doing that, uh, probably. Actually, I looked into this. The way is a TTY actually works is um, there's a special call you can make to the kernel. So I want to do a special device-specific operation uh, on this descriptor. and uh, you tell it you want to do a special device specific operation that only makes sense for terminals. And if the kernel comes back and says, no, you can't, no, you can't do that, ah, I'm confused. Uh, then you say, oh, not a terminal. <laughs> uh, seriously. <laughs> um, we find this out with S trace. Ooh, 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 okay. Somebody help me remember, I gotta, I gotta tell Julia this. Another use for S trace. All right. Uh, and then um, in Perl, this is actually, uh, there's a special operator. You say minus T, and it returns true if it's a terminal or false. If not, it's implemented using is a TTY. So, uh, so that's how LS works. All right. Here's another example. Um, this is not quite accurate. No, we're going to skip this. Let's go down to something else. All right. Yeah. All right. Current directory. We had questions about the current directory. Now we're going to answer them. We ran CD in the world's worst shell, and it said command not found. Why did that not work? And the answer is there is no CD command. There can't be. Um, you cannot write a command in Perl or in shell or in any other language that changes the current directory. What? Well, uh, here we are. I run PWD. That prints the working directory. I'm in only JD. Here's my do CD program. What's it going to do? It's going to run Shadir slash temp. Shadir is the system call that changes the directory. And then it prints out, uh, it runs the PWD command again. It says, I am now in, and it should say, I am now in temp. And then we run it. And it says, I am now in temp. It worked. And then we do PWD again, and we find we're not in temp. What went wrong? Who knows? Yeah. Well, it's just the child process. That's right. That's right. At the moment we ran curl do cd, it forked, the shell forked. The child process is running the script, which does in fact change the child process's current directory to slash temp. Then it runs pwd, which correctly reports that it's in temp, and then the child process commits suicide, and the parent process has been sitting around in that wait call the whole time, not going anywhere. And it's still in wherever we left it. You cannot write a command that changes the current directory. You can only change your own current directory, not the current directory of your parent process. Your answer is exactly correct. Um, and as a result, oh, here's a diagram of what I just said. Uh, I just said this. A CD command is not a command. It has to be, there's no bin CD. There can't be. You could write it, but it wouldn't work. Instead, it has to be built into the shell. So when you say CD to the shell, the shell says, oh, this isn't a command. I have to change my current directory. And it changes its current directory without forking a process. Uh, so we can add that to the world's worst shell. We'll have a hash here of built-in commands, which will say, OK, if the built-in command is CD, run this function, which does the shadir of whatever its argument is, or else issues a warning. And while we're here, who wants to say exit? No. Somebody, somebody suggested exit. Okay. I'll put it, exit can't be a command either. Because if you fork a process and it runs exit, that committing suicide and your parent shell does not, is still alive, it's waiting. So instead, it's a shell built in. And when you type exit, we'll run this function, which says exit. And if you've got an argument, 
you pass that as the value to exit, that's the program's exit status. Uh, and if you didn't get an argument to zero, that's a default, it means success. Uh, zero means success, and non-zero means failure. All right. Uh, and then we'll add this little bit of code here, so that, okay, well, you, we got the command, we parsed the command, and if we look up the command's name in this built-in hash and we find it, then we're not going to do the regular fork exact redirect thing. Instead, we are going to get the program from the table and run it with these specified arguments. And then we're going to, okay, once that finishes, if we're still alive, we go back and get the next one. Uh, we're going to do that once or twice quickly. Uh, I think that is shell two. Maybe shell three. Oh, no, this shell two is the redirect. Shell three. Yeah, there's shell three. It's got the built-ins up there. There's ls. It means ls thing. Pwd cd slash temp. Well, let's see first. Uh, okay, that worked. Ta-da. And now here's your exit command. Uh, so yes. Exit is also a keyword on on Perl. A keyword of Perl? Yeah, it is. It's yeah, a, a built-in Perl function. It's not it's a keyword, right it's a function. But yeah, it's built into Perl, and all it does is internally it calls the system's exit function. Um, it's a kernel call, because exit is a request to the kernel to destroy the current process. And you have to get the kernel involved to do anything with processes. So there's a system call, exit. You can say, please destroy me, and uh, also communicate this one byte of information back to my parent. That's the exit status. OK. OK? Any other questions? Set an environment variable. I'm sorry. Yes. No question. No. Uh, a command can't can't set an environment variable back in its parent. If you want to set an environment variable in the shell, you it won't work to run a command because the command will fork. The child process will get the change and then it'll go uh, exit and the change will be lost. If you want to set an environment variable, it has to be built in. Uh, so the program's memory is a really important example of something that you can't change. You can only change your own. And a subprocess forks, and it gets a copy, an exact copy of its parent's memory, just like when you go into the cloning store. The clone has an exact copy of all your memories. But then the clone can't go to the movies. And the clone goes to the movies. They know what the movie was about, but the original doesn't. Uh, so. Here is a real simple example. I have a variable called x set to parent. I fork. If fork returns 0, I'm now the child. x has parent in it. I will overwrite it with the child. And then the child continues and prints out x, which is now child. The parent skipped this in block and prints out parent. And so you see print parent and child on the terminal, one after the other, uh, in some order, which is random, because you don't know who runs first. Likely the child, but not necessarily. So the child can change its copy of this variable, but it can't change anything back in the parent. Um, not everything is copied. Some things, the child can change them, and it does affect the parent. Very few. This is kind of uh, this is kind of subtle, but I think it's important. Um, so here is here's the process is open file. Here. Original version of Unix, you could have 20 files open at once. 0, 1, and 2 were standard in, standard out, standard error, and the other 17 were free for use. So it's an array, it's indexed by file descriptor, and these things point into the system's open file table inside the kernel. Um, and the system's open file table, uh, each entry has two parts. It has a pointer to the inode, that represents the actual file that's open, or maybe it's a device file. Uh, and that says when you do the write or the read, um, that's how you decide where it actually goes. And then there's also what's called a seek pointer that says what's the current position in the file. Because say you write 50 bytes into, uh, into some file, right? And 
Now, when you call, make the next call to write, you, to write another 50 bytes, you want them to come after the first 50 bytes, not overwrite the first 50 bytes. That's what the C pointer is for. After the, when you open the file, the C pointer is set to zero. You write 50, the C pointer moves up to 50. Then the next time you do the write, the kernel knows don't overwrite those first ones, write them at position 50. Clear? So this is the system's open file table shared among all processes. They only have pointers into it. And then this has the pointers off to the system's open iNode table, which says which files are actually open. <coughs> Either of these tables could fill up, and you get a different error code depending on which one is full. It says you can't open any more files. And then there's a separate error for this table that's full. All right, so what happens I have this open this file descriptor table and I fork, what happens? It duplicates the file descriptor table. So the child gets all the same open file descriptors, but they're sharing the same entries in the system open file table uh, because they're open to the same files. Now, if the child then goes and closes standard out, that's here, it doesn't affect the parent. The parent still has standard out open, no problem. Uh, these things are garbage collected at the right time. But if the child changes the seek pointer, that's shared, and the parent will see the change. Now, why is that? Really important. Like the clones are living in the same house. Something like the clones are living in the same house. That's right. You know, if they if they move the cups to the other cabinet, then you're gonna like, wait, where's the cups? Oh, they're over here. Yeah. Yeah, it is kind of like that. <laughs> the kernel is the house. Yeah, Tom, so we can both that's Tom. Write the standard out. Yeah. Yeah. That's so we can both write the standard out and have them appear in the kernel? Uh, have them appear. Yeah, so, so the child and the parent can both write the standard out and have them both kind of appear in sequence? Uh, appear in sequence. Uh, yes, if, uh, if you're thinking of the right thing. Where is standard out attached? To terminal? Right. For terminal, no. Terminal actually doesn't even have a seek pointer. There's, you don't get to say, oh, I want to put the seek pointer back to zero and overwrite what I wrote you know, 12 years ago. Terminals don't work that way. And if you try to change the seek pointer in the terminal, there isn't even one. If you try to if you use the system call that says move the seek pointer, it says you can't seek this device. But it's for files. And now we'll see why. So here is a trivial shell script. Okay. It prints, I like Pi. It prints, especially Blackberry. When you run it on the terminal, it prints those two lines to the terminal. Now we're going to run this script and redirect it to Pi file. So here's what happens. The shell sees the redirection. It creates the file Pi file. And it attaches standard out to it, because that's what this redirection means. And the, initially, the seek pointer is at zero, because the file is new. Then it forks, and it's going to run echo. And echo says, OK, I've got to write the pi file here, and it writes, uh, it writes I like pi into the file, and that moves the seek pointer forward to position 12. And then the child exits. Now we're back here. And then the shell's going to run the second echo. So it works a second time, and the echo is going to write especially raspberry into the pi file. And if that seek pointer had not been advanced, the second echo would overwrite the first. <coughs> Got it? But because the seek pointer stayed the same, so it communicated to the shell, and then was preserved across the fork, the second write appears at position 12 and appears after the first write. So you wouldn't be able to write the files correctly if the seek pointers weren't shared. It's tricky, huh? Mm -hmm. They got it right. Questions about this? Your own segment, your brain is your segment. 
and then this other process has its own segment. You violated the segmentation by saying, I might want to look into your brain now. No, sorry. And the penalty is death. Not quite. The, uh, the penalty is you get shot with a segmentation violation signal. And if you haven't made special preparations, you die. Yes? When is the penalty death? When is the, by what, default. Why? Why is the penalty death? Yeah. Because if you're accessing, if you're accessing, what, what else is the kernel going to do? Oh. Um, you're trying to access, you're trying to do a read of memory, but it's not your memory, and it can't give you that memory. Could it return null? Obvious reasons. Could it return null? You look, you, it's an array. Yeah. You, you're looking in an array. Right? You're saying, what, what does this pointer point to? Uh, null is a fiction. Null exists in Python. It exists in Perl. It does not exist in machine language. There's no such thing. Right? You say, what's at memory address 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6? And the answer is a number between 0 and 255. That doesn't include null. OK? So we're, we're, we're like way down. The kernel has to do something. Uh, it could give you back 0, but that would be intensely confusing. And then you would proceed to do the wrong thing with the wrong data, and everything would go haywire. So you either announce your intention to the kernel ahead of time and prepare to deal with segmentation violations, or you die. Uh, and typically, you dump core, because it's like a real catastrophe. Um, you can say ahead of time, if, uh, if I get a seg fault, I just want to ignore it. Don't kill me. I'm prepared to just go ahead. Um, How do you do that? Mm, what happens if you ignore it? How do you do it? Or like, what's the result? But this is a system call you can make that says, I want to ignore segmentation faults. Uh, and uh, does it do? That's a really good question. I don't know. Uh, the other thing you can do that makes more sense is, if you were going to send me a segmentation fault, Please fix my program counter so that it points to this function instead of what I was doing. And then you like you do the thing, and instantly control is broken, and you end up in this handler. Uh, and then getting back from the handler is a little fussy, uh, but you can handle the condition. Uh, and it doesn't work very well, so you don't usually want to do it. Uh, all right. So then there's another signal that um, maybe makes more sense, which is um, it used to be you connect to the to the computer by calling it on a modem. And then when you hung up the modem, the process is there. It's no longer connected to you. What happens to it? Uh, and the answer is the kernel sends it a hang-up signal. So hey, your connection was hung up. Uh, and that has been translated into modern times as when I close the terminal window, the process running in it, typically the shell, gets a hang-up signal. And usually, the default response to a hang-up signal is you die. But you can say, I'm going to ignore hang-up signal and keep running. Or you can even say, I want to run a handler when, I get, when the phone is hung up. Um, now, sometimes you'd be like working on your horrible 10 character per second modem. You have this program, you start running the program, waiting for the output, but you know it's going to take a couple of hours. And you know the phone network isn't that good because it's 1972. And there's a good chance you're going to lose the connection somewhere. And you don't want your two hour process to die two minutes before it was going to print out the output. You redirected the output anyway to a file so you can pick it up later. Uh, and you don't want it to die just because you hung up the phone. So there's this program you can run. Little used these days. It's called nohop. You run your command. Nohop. You run your command under nohop and send the output there. And then even if you hang up the phone, it keeps running. It gets the hop signal and it ignores it. Um, this is now built into the ampersand operator. So that's the other thing it does. How does this work? Simple. So here is a process that has the hub signals handler is the default, which is to drop dead. And then the shell is going to fork. The signal handler is copy on fork. And then uh, most of the table is preserved across exec. So the shell for execs no hop. And the no hop is still going to die if there's a hub signal. And then what does no hop do? It just makes this system call, this kernel call. It says, oh, please change this from the default to ignore. And then, Nohop scoops out its brain and replaces it with the command you actually want it to run, which is now running in a slightly different environment, which is ignoring the hub signals. So if you hang up the phone and your long-running command gets sent to hub, it just ignores it and keeps going. So Nohop is really trivial. And here it is in Perl. It's three lines long. It's an interesting example because it's an exec without a fork. So first, make sure you've got some arguments. Otherwise, die with a usage message. No hop, command name, optional arguments. This is the Perl jargon for setting the, the signal handler entry. You say, oh, for hop, the 
action is ignored. And then that makes the corresponding underneath kernel call that actually implements this. And then you say exec, command and arguments. And if exec succeeds, you don't have to do anything else because you're gone. But if it fails, you die and say I couldn't exec. All right, well, you're not going to need NoHop. But there's like a zillion other commands that work the same way. Uh, Unix command, our Unix process has an alarm clock. The alarm clock has a certain amount of time before it rings. And when it rings, you get an alarm signal, which typically terminates the program, although you can change that. Uh, so here is a really useful utility. You know, actually, this is why we're actually talking about this. It's called stop after. You say, you have this command to run, but you want it to run for at most 30 seconds, and if it's going to take longer than that, it should die. So you say stop after 30, command R, 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 R. And what does stop after do? It gets that 30 here is the limit. It gets the command, and it gets the optional arguments. It says, uh, make sure that the alarm handler is set to the default, which is to exit when you get the alarm signal. Set the alarm clock to go off in that many seconds. And then run the command. Scoop out your brain and run the command. And then the command's running. And if the command itself doesn't tinker with the alarm, then it will die in 30 seconds at most. Because the kernel will, the alarm clock will run out, the kernel will send the signal, the process will, uh, the kernel will say, oh, default for an alarm signal is to die, and on. Cool? So I actually use this. It's, you know, it's, sometimes so it's just what you need. All right, I think we'll do like one more thing. So that's how nice works. Anybody know nice? No? All right, then we won't talk about nice. Um, uh, in addition to a current working directory, it also has a current root directory. Normally, it's set to the actual root of the file system, but under weird circumstances, you sometimes change that, and then you can't access any files that are outside the current root. Uh, and sometimes that's useful, and there could be a true command that changes the current root and then it's the program. You might try that out and see how it works. Uh, oh, we're all done. All right. Uh, then we can ignore the plug. Um, uh, this book is where I learned most of this stuff from. It, it, the first edition is just great. It's thin, just so lucid, and then there's this long exposition at the end about this guy was involved in um, like in Bell Labs in Cleveland writing high performance database systems under Unix and all the weird stuff he had to do to get this to work. Um, which I find this kind of thing fascinating when somebody's really talking about a problem that they're like, they work on really hard and all the details of it. Um, this book is famously terrific. Um, although I haven't read it, I'm going to recommend it anyway because everybody says it's great and everything else I've read by this guy is great. So um, the thing about the Rockkin book, first edition is much better than the second edition. Second edition is much fatter, that's bad, and it's blander. So go with the first one. Yeah. All right, we're done. I will take questions in private. You can all cluster around me, and uh, thank you all.